Now we want to start our talk. This time we are going to speak on the clear comprehension. Yesterday I mentioned uh, the four types of uh, clear comprehensions and I said I, was, I would uh, explain them in details today. In the previous section, we talked on the postures, standing, sitting, walking and lying down. And what is the difference between this and that? Here also we have, uh, uh, when going forward or back, he fully aware, he is fully aware of what he is doing. In the previous section also we said when he walks, he is fully aware of walking. He knows, he understands walking. And here it says that he should uh, uh, fully understand uh, when he uh, when he's going forward and backward. When we say we walk, of course we are walking forward. <laughs> now, what is the difference between this and that? In the previous section, uh, the, the meditator is supposed to be fully aware of what involves in walking. And in this section, Buddha goes into further detail of what involves in walking. Not only walking, walking forward and walking backward. Walking backward doesn't mean that you face the one direction and <laughs> walk backward. That means you turn and walk. In walking meditation also we do that. But here word comprehension is used, that is sampajanya is used. In the other, sampajanya is not used. Uh, in that section we uh, read gachanto, gachanto va gachamiti pajanati, going forward, going or walking, he knows that he is walking. Here the meditator is supposed to do walking forward or backward with full clear comprehension. And many activities are involved here, not only walking uh, and it says walking backward and alokite vilokite when he is looking forward or back. Actually, uh, some, uh, then samminjite pasarite, bending or stretching. Then uh, sanghati patta chivara dharane, carrying his upper robe outer robe and arms ball. Then asite pite kaite saite when eating, drinking, chewing and tasting. Then uchara pasava kame uh, excreting and urinating. Then gate tite nisinisute jagrite 
bhāsite tunhi bhāve when walking, standing, falling asleep, awaking, talking, uh, remaining silent, he fully awares, he is fully aware of what he is doing. That means, of course, even here, few activities are mentioned. Six groups of activities are mentioned, <coughs> or uh, uh, seven groups of activities. Uh, but you can add more activities. Whatever activity we are engaged in, we perform that activity with full comprehension. Now, what are the f comprehensions I mentioned yesterday? One is the purpose, clear comprehension of the purpose. Purpose of walking forward, backward, and so forth. I, I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, discourse, we already discussed uh, the practice of these four foundations of mindfulness has fivefold purpose for the purification of beings, to overcome sorrow and lamentation, to overcome suffering and disappointment, to tread the path leading to liberation and attaining enlightenment. These are the fivefold purposes. And one must understand these purposes when one walks forward, backward, and engaged in any particular activity. For instance, one must ask oneself, is this particular activity that I am engaged in helps me to purify my mind. Purification is one of the purposes. I walk forward and while I am walking forward, does my mind engage in the walking to purify the mind? That means, do I walk forward with greed in my mind? just to enjoy my walk, to increase my aversion, to compete with somebody, to become full of uh, aversion. Does any of these things arise in my mind when I walk? If any of them arises, then I must be mindful of that. So, I would remove it at that time from my mind in order to cleanse my mind. That means, while engaged in any of these activities, we must keep uh, the purpose. That is. I perform all these activities in order for me to understand what I am doing so that I will be able to clean my mind. Remember uh, Venerable Ananda attained enlightenment, uh, the first stage of enlightenment. Remember the way this, this is the only incident uh, we come across in the Tipitaka where somebody attained enlightenment free from any particular posture. <laughs> I say he was in a 49 degree angle, <laughs> no 45 degree angle, neither 80 degree, no 90 degree, but when he was about to lie down, 
he attained enlightenment. Why and how? Because all the time he kept the purpose of his practice and fully awake, fully mindful of everything that was going on on his mind and body. Another person attained enlightenment while walking, many, those records we can find many places in, in the sutras. When about Chakupala, Chakupala, uh, the first story in the Dhammapada commentary uh, illustrating the, the meaning of the stanza of the first stanza of the Dhammapada. And he refused to lie down. He assumed only three postures, sitting, standing and walking. He refused to lie down. So one day when he was walking, while he was walking, he attained enlightenment. But since he had not had any moment of sleep, never lied down, simultaneously with the attainment of enlightenment, he lost his eyesight. Although he lost his physical eyes, he got eye of wisdom, wisdom eye. It is said that he attained enlightenment. That happened when he was while he was walking. There are some other inc incidents where we uh, have read monks uh, attaining enlightenment while walking, while sitting while standing, because all the time they were, uh, they, they kept their purpose in mind and engaged in activity, keeping the purpose. When one talks with somebody with mindfulness, talk in a, a sorrowful situation, somebody uh, full of si situation arises, um, somebody's death or somebody is seriously sick and uh, you are yourself seriously sick and so forth. Uh, that is of course uh, 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 an event or situation where sorrow can arise. So engaged in that conversation, keeping in mind the purpose of mindfulness. I practice mindfulness not to allow my sorrow increase. How can I stop that? I must see the reality, that reality of life, impermanence. So, uh, whether we go forward, we keep that in mind, and we return, we keep that in mind. When we turn away, we keep that in mind, and stretching, bending, eating, drinking, sleeping, while, uh, you know, defecating, urinating, wearing clothes, wearing upper robes, and so forth, I mentioned because of the for the, in the case of monks and monastics. But uh, one must keep uh, the purpose, even anybody who practices meditation, even a lay person. Now, eating <coughs> and drinking, uh, chewing, munching, swallowing, tasting, how can one be mindful of that? How can one keep the purpose of uh, the practice? I think you may, you may uh, uh, remember when we eat in the morning and noon, 
uh, morning time and noon time, we recite a passage. I don't know how many of you look at the meaning of the passage that we recite. We recite, I partake this food with mindful reflection. Uh, neva davaya, na madaya, na vibhusanaya. I eat this not to increase my uh, uh, fat, increase my greed, increase my uh, uh, just eat, eat as a game or play, uh, not to decorate na mandanaya, na vibhusana, not to show uh, any you know, beauty or make myself more beautiful, attractive, but yava devi imasakaya satitya, in order to maintain this body, vihing suparatiya, to overcome my clinging, yava uh, devi Brahmacharya Nugahaya, in order to help my celibate life, Iti Purana Anche Vedanam Patihankami, I overcome my previous pain of hunger, Navanche Vedanam Naupadesami, I would not arouse new pain of overeating. Yatrajame Bhavisati to maintain this life. So we make ourselves very uh, humble while we are eating. When we go on, uh, for instance, Pindapata. Uh, with arms ball in our hand, if we receive something, it's okay. If we do not receive anything, that's okay too. When we keep mindfulness in mind, since we walk mindfully to collect food, we say to ourselves, if we receive food, it's okay. We mindfully come and mindfully eat. If we do not receive any food, we spend that time in meditation. <laughs> if you don't have food to eat, we spend that time in meditation. So the mindfulness always must be kept in mind. And the purpose of our uh, going forward, backward and so forth must be kept in mind. That means our purpose always is to cleanse the mind, purify the mind, overcome sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. In whatever activities we are engaged in, we have to keep this fivefold purpose. When we walk, if we see an object, pleasing object, attractive object, enticing object, then we mindfully reflect on the object. Na nimittagahi nanubhyanjanagahi, Buddha said. Don't get involved in details or signs of the object or into detail. Don't, don't get involved in detail, thinking this is beautiful, this is handsome, this is attractive, this is this and that, or this is, uh, uh, I, want, I want this, uh, I like this, and so forth. Uh, without that kind of mental, emotional reaction, we just become, as Buddha said, uh, to Bahya Daruchiriya, Ditte ditte matta. When we see 
an object, be mindful that it is just an object. Sute sutamattang, what we uh, heard, just become mindful of that sound only. Uh, so in every situation, uh, be, re, keep the purpose in mind so that uh, uh, the mindfulness will remain uh, strong and the mind slowly uh, become, becomes uh, clear and pure and uh, uh, that makes our uh, practice uh, of mindfulness strong, then to tread the path, then we, 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 we uh, fall onto the path when we keep mindfulness always intact. Then to attain liberation. So, uh, keep asking, how can I use this to attain liberation? And so forth. Asite pite, when we eat, we have to, sometimes when we uh, uh, eat, most of the time meditators are advised to eat very slowly, moving hand very uh, into the plate slowly and uh, grab food slowly and bring, that slow motion itself is not enough. But we must be more mindful about what is happening in the mind, not physically, physical mo uh, motions. While we are eating, that is why here it is said, uh, uh, eat uh, uh, what uh, is uh, Eating, chewing, drinking, and tasting. When we eat, we must see whether greed arises in the mind. If the food is very tasty, greed definitely arises. Then we go to watch, be mindful, not to overeat. Similarly, when we drink, if the drink is tasty, we go to watch the mind, not to let greed arise. Uh, munching, chewing, and so forth and so on. Doing these activities slowly is one thing, in order to see what involves in these activities. But the other thing is to watch the mind to fulfill this purpose, that is to be content, to be uh, not greedy. Uh, so the purpose of uh, the practice is to remove, reduce our greed, reduce our clinging, craving. All the time we have to keep that in mind. Then that's the first purpose. The, I mean, the, the first clear comprehension, the purpose. The second clear comprehension is the suitability. Suitability is, uh, uh, is this practice suitable for attaining this goal? Our goal is uh, purifying the mind and all these fivefold purposes. Then we must ask ourselves, is this practice suitable for gaining those fivefold purposes? Uh, or is there something else that I had to do? Uh, I'm uh, walking, talking, sitting, standing, lying down and all these things and uh, breathing, paying attention to all this. Are all these suitable for gaining these purposes? If we do all these things with mindfulness, definitely these are suitable. If we engaged in something else 
<coughs> something unwholesome, we will know that is not suitable. That is not suitable for gaining this purpose. So, suitability is always something wholesome. We must ask, is this wholesome? Is this proper? Is this suitable for gaining this purpose? Sometimes people say suitability is a place, asking uh, ourselves, uh, is this place suitable to practice meditation? Is this suitable for uh, suitable place to visit? Actually, these are very simple, ordinary things. Anybody who is not even very mindful would know whether certain places are suitable to visit or not. Uh, it's a common sense thing going to, suppose you want to practice meditation, you never think of going to a supermarket <laughs> to sit down and meditate. <coughs> you know that. But the suitability is, uh, is this subject, this subject is suitable to practice, to attain this goal. Uh, is this mental attitude is suitable for gaining this goal? Is my intention is suitable to gain this? Is my speech suitable for gaining this? Am I uh, using wrong speech? Do I do wrong action? Is this action suitable for gaining this? So we got to go through the whole Noble Eightfold Path, asking the question, uh, is this the understanding that I should have? Is this understanding suitable for gaining this? Is this intention is suitable? Is this speech is suitable? Ask, go through the entire Noble Eightfold Path and ask, is this suitable? Not only the place, not only the posture, not the cloth, not only the food, but everything that we do, we must ask this question, is this suitable for gaining this, these purposes? Then the third clear comprehension is the domain. Uh, sometimes uh, people ask, what is domain? Domain is the field. Sometimes uh, uh, Buddha said the domain is Samma Sankappa. Samma Sankappa Gochara. Uh, as opposed Micca Sankappa. Samma, samma Sankappa. Uh, Gochara is mentioned in the Dhammapada. Uh, the right thought is the field for mindfulness meditation, right thought. Uh, in other places, it is mentioned right, uh, what you call um, uh, uh, proper. Uh, domain are the four foundations of mindfulness themselves. That is our domain. In some other places it is mentioned, our domain of mindfulness is the five aggregates. That is our domain. When we say our domain is five aggregates, or we say our domain is the four foundations of mindfulness, we mean the same thing, because four foundations of mindfulness deal with five aggregates, as we have mentioned. That is our domain. For our, uh, to attain this goal, to achieve this purpose, we don't have to look for anything outside. Don't look for anything outside. 
all we have within ourselves. This is our university, our encyclopedia, our laboratory, our domain, our field, everything we want to know is in here, in this body and mind, in these five aggregates. Don't leave that. <laughs> Generally, that is not what we do. Since we are most of the time unmindful, we don't use our body and mind to cultivate mindfulness, but we use others' bodies and minds. And we don't use our laboratory, we go borrow others' laboratories. <laughs> we don't use our own encyclopedia, we borrow others' encyclopedia. We think about how other people eat, how other people drink, how the world is uh, turning around. And always we are looking outside, listening to outside things, smell outside things. What is very close to us, we never pay any attention. We never know that. <laughs> we can smell somebody's mouth few yards away. But our mouth can we smell? It is so close to the nose. <laughs> less, <laughs> less, than an, less than an inch close. You see? We never smell the our odor of our own mouth. <laughs> By the way, you tried one day to smell your mouth? <laughs> you never do that. Never can do it. That is the nature. I have a <laughs> most obvious things we ignore and we always, most obvious things within ourselves we ignore and we go outside. Uh, Buddha said uh, he gave a very, several very beautiful stories to, uh, for us to remember. Especially when we think of uh, domain, we must remember these stories. Very tiny, beautiful little stories. One is uh, um, hawk and quail. You can find it in Sanghita Nikaya. Quail is such a tiny little bird. One day this bird uh, came out of his uh, field and uh, you know, walked, uh, wandered around. And uh, everything he saw around was very beautiful, very clean, attractive. So he flew from one place to another and he was sitting on a field. And then big hawk stooped down and caught this little quail. And while he was in the, the hawk's uh, claws, uh, quail began to cry. He said, uh, Oh, poor me, I'm so sad today. This is my unlucky day. Had I been in my own ancestral domain, this hawk will never, uh, uh, would, never uh, would never be a match in fight. I can easily defeat him. Had I been in my own domain, this hawk would not be a match. I would defeat him. Then the hawk, without uh, boasting his own strength and his own power and all this, he simply asked the quail, <coughs> where is your domain? You have ancestral field. He said that big field, with there are, there are fresh big clots of mud just freshly ploughed and big clods of mud are there. That is my domain. Ah, okay. So the hawk brought him and dropped him in his own field and said, but remember, next time when I come, you cannot boast like this. I will catch you. Okay. He dropped him there. Next day, the quail came out and stood on a big a clot of mud and uh, basking in the sun, enjoying the you know air. 
making, you know, singing song. Then uh, Ho came. As Ho came closer, this little quail hid himself under big clod of mud. Ho came and looked around and he could not find him. And he was so angry, he, you know, beat his own breast and flew away. So Buddha said, quail was safe in his own field. He knows the area, he knows the, the big uh, clods of mud to hide in somebody else's field, he was not safe. Buddha said, similarly, in your own domain, you are safe. Use your domain, he said. Don't go to some other's domain. <coughs> Another little story Buddha said, also you can see in Sangyutta Nikaya to illustrate this domain, is a monkey. In, um, he said in uh, Himalayan regions there are certain areas where there are no animals, no trees, nothing, just as snow. And there are certain other areas there are uh, some little trees and some snow, but not human beings and animals go there. But there are other regions, lower regions, where there are trees and animals. And uh, people find monkeys there. They set traps. Experienced monkeys stay in their own area. They see the trap, although it is attractive with a lot of food in the trap, the experienced monkeys would not go there. They look at the trap and walk away. Inexperienced greedy monkeys would go to that area and uh, walking around and see this trap with a lot of enticing tasty food and they go and get caught in the trap. Then the people who set the trap do whatever they want with the monkey. Buddha said similarly if you uh, wander away from your own field, the Mara will come and catch you. When the Mara comes, uh, comes and catches you, you will be in great trouble. So he said, always stay in your own domain. What is your domain? Your own body and mind. Your own five aggregates. Always come back to the five aggregates. Always come back to the four foundations of mindfulness. And that is your four main. So, when we walk, sit, stand, turn back, eat, drink and engage in any activity, look at the relationship, those uh, relationship of those activities with the four foundations of mindfulness. Any activity we are engaged in can be directly related to the four foundations of mindfulness. To all the four foundations, not only one. You take any activity, that activity involves the body, feelings, perceptions, thoughts and consciousness. You, you take a pencil and write, that is an activity. In that activity you find your body is engaged in it, your thoughts are <laughs> engaged in it, your feeling is there, your perception is there, your consciousness is there. All the five aggregates are involved in everything and anything that we do. So Buddha said, look at them with the intention <coughs> of gaining insight into the reality of these aggregates. When we write, there is a, uh, we experience feelings. We experience the, the bodily movements. We experience our perceptions. 
we experience our thoughts, we experience our consciousness, and see how these, all these change while we are writing. And be mindful of that impermanence of these aggregates when we are engaged in any particular activity. So, that is our domain. That is clear comprehension of domain. That is clear comprehension, full understanding, clear understanding of the five aggregates in our activities. No matter what activity it is. <coughs> Last clear comprehension is the clear comprehension of non-delusion. Non-delusion is uh, extremely important. That, of course, is, uh, I must say, the essence of mindfulness practice. The essence of mindfulness practice is non-delusion. Non-delusion refers to clear understanding of non-existence of self. Non-delusion means very clear understanding of non-existence of self. That is, when we look at any particular activity among all these, all this and any more activities that we are engaged in, none of these, in, in none of these activities can we find self or ego or I. I mentioned in my <coughs> little talk on the Vesak day, <laughs> that is very, very nice little uh, thing you, we have to remember. <coughs> the moment we are born, that very moment, greed arises, ignorance arises. And greed recognizes ignorance. Because these two have been in existence in samsara for a so long period of time. Therefore, the very moment greed arises, ignorance arises, and then rec they recognize each other, they are mature enough to fall in love with each other. <laughs> <laughs> The very moment we are born, greed is very, very mature, and ignorance is fully matured, grown. And they recognize each other. They, they don't have to do any special dating. That very moment, they fall in love with, with each other. And next instant, they give birth to a, their first child. What is the first child that the greed and ignorance give, uh, uh, greed gives birth to ignorance? What do you call the, the child? Uh, ignorance and greed uh, mate. So, uh, greed gives birth to the child. This child is called I. Child's name is I. So the greed and ignorance are the parents. And they keep supporting this I, their child. You think about it, how I comes into existence. So, greed and ignorance, the parents of I, keep supporting, nourishing, feeding, taking care of I. Occasionally, <laughs> the greed and ignorance never get tired of taking care of their baby. I. Occasionally, however, they get tired and either greed or ignorance goes and consults their counselors. The counselors are jealousy, anger, fear, competition, you know, 
greed for false reputation and uh, sneakiness, uh, all kind of uh, uh, negative things. They are the counselors of greed and ignorance. So greed and ignorance go and uh, ask advice from their counselors. Now we are troubled with our child. <laughs> the child is I. What shall you do? The counselors unanimously tell, don't worry, you are doing quite well. <laughs> Go on, support your eye. Keep supporting. Never reduce it. Never weaken it. Don't try to get rid of it. You will be in trouble. If you get rid of your eye, you will be in trouble. Because uh, uh, this counselor says, your, your child is very important for you, for your perpetual existence, this life and the next life, and life after that. So, but the parents are very tired of them because this uh, the child has a very big ego. <laughs> the parents get tired of this ego. But they cannot do it, and they cannot do anything about it. So, this is how uh, delusion, confusion arises. When we are mindful, then the greed is threatened, ignorance is threatened and their child is threatened. Greed becomes very shaky. Ignorance becomes shaky. And consequently their child, I become shaky. So Buddha advised us, be mindful. Non-delusion is an attempt to see through this acti these activities, the non-existence of this self. Self is a notion, which really in reality does not exist. We can see that through activities, eating, drinking, sleeping, walking, wearing clothes and this and that. Through these activities, we can see these activities arise dependent upon something else. No activities can uh, occur, can take place independently. And therefore, <coughs> uh, when we see the activities with the clear comprehension, we will see the non-existence of self. That is, all these activities are interdependently uh, arising, interdependently passing away. All these activities are empty within themselves. There is no any single permanent eternal entity in them. They are all impermanent. No substance no core, nothing is embedded in these activities. Seeing that is called clear comprehension of non-delusion. We will not be deluded anymore any in future with regard to self. If we see these activities with mindfulness and clear comprehension. So, So Buddha used these activities in order to show the way how we can clear, we can, we can uh, 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 perform this activity with a uh, clear comprehension of the purpose, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, the, me the suitability, uh, domain and non-delusion. 
because through activities we can see, we can, uh, we can see reality. <coughs> uh, we can achieve the purpose of cleansing the mind through activities. Uh, through activities we can see whether, the, whether what we are doing is suitable or not. Through activities we can see the domain that is our uh, body and mind. That means whenever we perform any activities all the five aggregates are involved, we can see them. And through activities we can see non-delusion, that means uh, non-existence of self. And therefore, activities are used uh, for cultivating, developing our true, deep, clear understanding. That is what clear comprehension of uh, fourfold clear comprehensions. <coughs> I think this uh, is enough uh, for this afternoon. Uh, as a talk, perhaps uh, today is our uh, day of discussion. So, you may uh, perhaps uh, have a lot of questions. So, you write down the questions and we can have a discussion in the evening.